Welcome to you today. I'm Paul Pepis, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. I'm here in the Schnitzer Gallery of the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art at the U of O with my guest today, artist and filmmaker Philip Haas. Best known perhaps for his 2012 sculpture exhibition, The Four Seasons, and his 1995 film, Angels and Insects, Haas began his career as a documentary filmmaker depicting profiles of 10 artists. His exhibition of film installations, Butchers, Dragons, Gods, and Skeletons at the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth, Texas, was listed by Time Magazine as one of the top 10 museum shows of 2019. In this gallery, JSMA is hosting the world premiere of Haas's performance installation, Sculpture Breathes Life into Painting and Music, on view May 29th through June 9th, 2019. Thanks, Philip, for coming on the show. Thank you. So let's um, go back and start with your background and how you came to be a filmmaker. Well, I was university, I was interested in the theater, and I directed a lot of shows with uh, students. And then leaving Harvard, where I was an undergraduate, I went to the UK, to London, and spent a couple of years uh, working as an assistant um, with various directors, including a wonderful director named Clifford Williams, who was the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, but at the same time, I met socially Gilbert and George, and that was this, my introduction into the world of cinema. <laughs> okay, so your earliest films, including the Gilbert and George uh, singing sculpture film, um, were all documentaries about artists. So why, why was that the focus of your filmmaking career at the start? I think it was Providence, really. Um, so after having spent a couple of years knocking around um, in England in the theater, um, I returned to the States, um, and I worked um, as an assistant to James Ivory, a wonderful um, film director. Uh, on a and a UOO alumnus. Did um, you know of course. Yeah. Um, so Jim was doing um, a television film, and um, I had known his uh, producer, Ismail Merchant, and so they invited me to, to work with Jim as his assistant. And that was uh, my equivalent of going to film school. So armed um, with um, a social uh, kind of a relationship with Gilbert and George and a little bit of knowledge of how to make a film, um, I approached the Arts Council in the UK and they funded a, the, a film that we did, which was not the singing sculpture, that was a later film, but a film called The World of Gilbert and George. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you, you call yourself a recovering filmmaker. That's true. <laughs> and uh, so why did you turn from filmmaking to making art, especially sculpture, installation, and performance? Well, so after having made 10 films with artists, um, I then had an appetite and was able to fulfill it um, doing feature films. So I made maybe half a dozen films, generally uh, based on interesting works of literature, including Angels and Insects, which you mentioned, Up at the Villa with Sean Penn, um, and found it very sort of stimulating and exciting. and. Uh, um, and freeing, um, but you know, it's, a, it's a wicked world, the film world, and um, although I had a certain amount of success, I had a certain amount of um, economic uh, failure, at least you know, failure for the, the people who invested in the films, and it made it harder to, to fund movies. So um, I thought, well, maybe I should try something a little bit different, um, and um, I was approached by the uh, Kimball Art Museum to um, bring my filmmaking skills to doing an exhibition which would in some way celebrate the work of arts, the, wor the works of art in, their, um, in the museum. So more than just doing films, I wanted to make it a, a proper exhibition, uh, to make um, uh, film installations, so most of the films were multi-paneled. I did a film on a, uh, inspired by a Tiepolo ceiling drawing that we built a room inside the um, the Kimbo as uh, a kind of faux Venetian palazzo, or the main room in a faux Venetian, Venetian palazzo, and that was projected onto the ceiling and onto the walls. Um, and it was a marvelous experience because I was um, freed from the constraints of commercial uh, filmmaking, so I could make them any length, mm -hmm. um, any type of, uh, of presentation. Yes, I know. I mean, the shortest one, I think, is seven minutes long right. from that. Um, and then, so the next major art project you do is the Four Seasons sculptures, which are also based on previous uh, artwork by Giuseppe uh, Arcambolo, Oldo. So say a little bit about that one. Okay, well, let me just backtrack a moment. So the, uh, the five film installations, uh, Butchers, Dragons, Gods, and Skeletons, are actually presented in a different format here in this exhibition. Mm -hmm. They're um, 
um, imprisoned uh, um, in a picture frame on an easel that sits in the middle of the room. Mm -hmm. So, but that show, in addition to doing um, uh, um, f film presentation, film installations, I also um, used certain kind of architectural and sculptural devices. For example, the Ensor film was projected on four panels inside a walk-in skull. Um, so that whet my appetite for actually making some sculpture. So um, often my um, work, whether it's in film or, or, you know, or in fine art, starts with an idea for an idea. So with the Archimboldo project, the Four Seasons, it started with the idea of I'd like to make a sculpture, a large sculpture in a garden. So um, I approached the Brooklyn Botanic Garden um, about doing such a project, and they said, great, come and talk to us about it. So I then was like, well, what is this going to be? But as you've, <laughs> as you've mentioned, you know, my work is often in dialogue with the history of art. So this is a true story. I went to the Strand Bookstore in New York, which has a fantastic uh, uh, art, art uh, book section, and started at A, and there was Archimboldo, <laughs> I mean, whose work I knew. Um, and so the, uh, so the first um, sculpture in the Four Seasons series was Winter, which is this 15-foot high uh, uh, tree looking like a man. Um, and the piece ended up not going to the Brooklyn Botanic Garden, but it went to the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C., and then Versailles. And that sort of launched me on my sculptural career and, and put me on the track of sort of a recovering film director. So say a little bit about the fact, I mean, almost all of your work in whatever medium or genre responds to, draws on, and or remakes works of literature or visual art. So why is, why is that important to you? Why, why is that the way that you approach art making? Well, I think I'm interested in the idea that, that, that art and life is a continuum. And really, if you're in the art trade or you're in the film trade, even if you say, I'm, I, I pay no attention to what came before me, you know, the past is a graveyard. I don't want to go and step my foot into it. You can't, you know, it's impossible. I mean, D.W. Griffith invented cinema. He invented the, he invented the, the, the uh, um, film going through a camera, but the way in which we put uh, films together. So we're all the children of that racist D.W. Griffith. Uh, uh, um, and, you know, artists are forever borrowing. I mean, what's that great line of Picasso? I don't borrow, I steal. Uh, um, so if Picasso can borrow steel, I can too. <laughs> okay. So um, the performance installation at the JSMA, um, Sculpture Breathes Life into Painting and Music, um, we're going to show some uh, footage from that performance. Um, tell me what led to the conception of the installation and the performance. How did you come up with this concept? Again, it was an idea for an idea. And I wanted to do something where I wasn't sort of behind the camera, as it were, or sort of behind the art, but I was part of the art. So what I wanted to do was a performance. I wasn't quite sure what it was going to be, but um, and I, it, I, I, it, it was that idea to put myself forefront into it. And then I started to think about what it could be, and, and I wanted it to have elements I wanted it to be interesting regardless of when you walked into the space, that, the sp that it could work without me. So it became a kind of interactive piece. By that I mean I interact with the work and the, the spectator views this interaction. So um, my intention was that when I'm not in the piece, it's alive, and when I'm in the piece, it's alive in a different way. So, uh, but some, a lot of this work, there are more than 35 individual pieces, um, was made specifically for the show. Some of it um, uh, predates the show. But I feel that the 35 works together make a single piece. Um, hence, sculpture breathes life into painting and music. Mm -hmm. So um, some of the pieces are um, sculptures that are based on casts of your face. Some of them have been made into instruments. So say a little bit about that, those, part, those pieces in the work. Um, what are they doing? What inspired you to do those? Well, I'm interested in portraiture. Um, I had done a show five or six years ago in a commercial gallery in New York um, in which I, um, in some way, even if it was um, sort of subliminal or to the side, uh, made portraits of um, historical artists. So I did a portrait of Van Gogh, and it was his chair. Um, I did a portrait, uh, um, a conjugal portrait of uh, a great but somewhat neglected um, surrealist photographer, uh, Boifard, and his wife. 
um, embracing, uh, um, I'll say somewhat elliptically. Um, so um, I wanted to sort of continue with this theme and also include portraits of myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted, I mean, the, um, the proposition with this show is that sculpture triumphs all. Yes. So um, uh, I wanted to make objects that could play, musical objects, but I wanted to invent them. So some of them are like, you know, it's a life cast of my head with strings coming out of it. So in the, in the sort of manner of a, of a, uh, of a Roman, from, as in Roman antiquity, um, lyre. Some are, uh, I have a composite instrument made out of, um, uh, a composite hybrid made out of a, a harp, a lyre, the lyre's case, um, uh, an hourglass, and a radio embedded in it. So if you were to ask me what instrument I, I play, I can tell you I play the radio. <laughs> and some of these portraits of artists are included in the show, are they? That is correct. So say something about um, those. There's a piece which is called Muse, and um, it, it emanates, comes out of the wall. It's, um, so it's a viola da gamba with a woman's, uh, um, a woman's arm and hand fingering it. And at the top of the bridge, where the keys are, there's a portrait. And it's a portrait of the 17th century ar artist Eustache Le Sir because this image came from a painting he did. Um, the, there's a portrait of uh, Merit Oppenheim, another great surrealist, as a drunken centaur. Um, and um, there, there's a, two hands holding um, paintbrushes coming out of the wall. Um, and the idea for that came from a photograph of Brassailles, the celebrated uh, French photographer, took a Jean-Jacques uh, 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 Villon, um, who was Duchamp's older brother. And it's a portrait of him standing up holding his brushes. I got rid of everything but his hands and the brushes. Um, so it's, the performance is also accompanied by a uh, spoken uh, uh, narrative. Um, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I, I wanted the piece, I mean, I described the piece to Jill um, Hartz, the director of the museum, who I'm deeply, um, um, in debt to for inviting and, and happy uh, um, to have been invited here. Um, and I described the piece before it was made as having movement, so that head has movement, I walk around, fetishized costume, I wear a costume, I'm not sure how fetishized it is, but it feels fetishized to me. Um, music, um, a spoken word. So I wanted it to have some spoken word. Um, and um, then I became imprisoned by this idea of, how, you know, what would it be? Um, so, um, I needed to find something that felt in keeping with what you're seeing visually. Um, so, with this idea of, of sculpture triumphing over these uh, baser arts, I put together a text, some of it um, um, sort of newly uh, written by myself and a lot of it pulled from, um, uh, from various art historical documents, um, you know, of, of some hundred years ago, or several hundred years ago, um, sometimes in the artist's voice, sometimes in a critic's voice. Off, I often quote it, you know, saying like, um, as Gauguin said, or as, as Ruskin said. Um, you mentioned the music. Say a little bit about that. So, um, again, I promised that there would be some music, some, a soundscape for this. Um, having made films, I know what music can do to sort of influence both favorably and and unfavorably a, a visual experience. And I didn't want it to be, I wanted it to be a part of it, but without making you feel sad or happy, um, which is often what film scores do. Um, and I didn't want it to be overpowering. Um, since the show goes on all day, even if I'm not in it, I wanted it not to be able to be looped, but without it feeling like, uh, um, you know, you, it was gonna give you a headache. So it struck me that, um, I could, some of these instruments that I made had strings. I could record the, the sound of the strings, sample it, and then make melodies or discordant sounds with it. So the, um, the, so the sound uh, scape has these, uh, the, the sampled sounds. There are a lot of trumpets in the show, so um, the, the composer I work with, Jeff Beale, is a wonderful trumpet player, so he's, he's uh, crooning on his, um, uh, on his trumpet. Um, I, I live in a small island in the Bay of um, Naples called Procida, which is the home, or the area is the home of the sirens of antiquity. 
so um, some local singers uh, um, wail on the score, the, the, the sirens. So that sort of put it together. <laughs> um, does the music, musical soundscape run all the time, even when you're not performing, or only when you're doing? Yeah, it, it runs all the time. Um, say a little bit about the um, construction or the manufacture of the sculptural pieces. What, what are they made of? How did you make them? So uh, uh, there are m many different materials used. So some of the more straightforward um, sculptural elements are bronze, uh, marble, marble with resin, um, wood, um, but there are also uh, material like garden hose, the, um, uh, the trumpet crown I wear on my head, which is a, a life cast of my face, along with a, a, a sculpted trumpet, the, the sort of tubing is garden hose. Um, the, uh, there are sort of found objects. Uh, the accordion is a, is a sort of a, a cor an accordion that I found on eBay in disrepair that I then added things to. Uh, um, there's leather, bone, uh, um, I don't think any fluids, <laughs> except for my own. Yeah, yeah. And did you manufacture, did you create all the pieces yourself, or did you have I work with fabricators. Uh -huh. So, uh, um, you know, I think it's been quoted, or it's been quoted me quoting myself, saying, I sculpt by thinking. So I, I'm a conceptual artist. I come up with ideas, and I work with very skilled people to realize them. Um, how do you think of your body as you interact with these pieces? What, how would you characterize the kind of way that you perform physically? Well, you know, it's interesting because um, I had anticipation um, of what it might be like to be a, a sculptor. To be um, to be a, an object with other uh, with other inanimate objects, but I feel very much um, in dialogue with this work, um, and um, my text um, it changes. So it's interesting how um, if you come into the room and I'm not here, the um, physical three dimensional uh, um, uh, sculptures that are not kinetic don't change. I mean they change in terms of if the light changes, the light's pretty, um, st uh, 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 pretty standard, but in terms of where you are and, and so forth. But what I do, what I say, um, how I interact changes. So in some ways, uh, I mean, I had a thought, I would, this, this is a two week long piece and I'm in it the whole, the whole time, but I feel that it really comes alive for me when there's an audience. So, you know, I've now done it half a dozen times, sometimes with a group of students, and they move like a wave, sometimes in a more cocktail party um, experience where people are holding onto their drinks, as it were, and uh, a, a little bit sort of uncertain as what's going on. Um, I think uh, the day after tomorrow, I'm, I will do it to a, a group of 50 10-year-olds. Uh, uh, um, I'm interested to um, see their response when I say I'm suffering from sculpture fever. <laughs> yes. So you, you mentioned to me before we started the interview that when you were originally imagining what you would do, you, you thought you would sort of um, spew the script just all at once. But you found that that, that didn't turn out to be the right yeah, way. Yeah, I mean, I'm, um, I don't want to do this as an actor. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't want people to come up and say, oh, you did this really well. I, you know, I like in the sense that you don't go, I mean, I'm being a little bit facetious, but you don't go up to Michelangelo's David and say, hey, yeah, that's a nice pose you got there, mate. Uh, uh, um, <laughs> um, so I wanted it to be organic. So I try to get myself in a state where I am this character. I am this man, this, this, this sort of the maniac in a table, uh, um, and, and stay in that. And... Um, and not be worried about what the text is, but let the text come out. Mm -hmm. um, I want to be able to cover a, a fair amount of it, but you know, I feel that you know, what's important is the spirit of it. Um, not the, you know, you're not coming to see a theatrical presentation, you're coming to see, to experience a, an installation. That, and I, I've been pleased in terms, I mean, I'm obviously inside looking out, but um, in my discussions with uh, people who've seen the show, um, they feel that my presence is, um, is not a detraction. Mm -hmm. And I was worried, you know, when I saw the show was installed first and I installed myself afterwards, I thought I was feeling, you know, that, that the um, preparators here who worked with me, we did a really nice installation and it didn't, you know, I didn't want to screw it up. But I think um, um, that in fact, rather than screwing it up, I bring 
uh, you know, I bring it more to, uh, um, uh, I, I give another dimension to it. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look at some of the performance now. I am suffering from sculpture fever. Reynolds' self-portraits have been so numerous as to bid defiance of enumeration. People say it's hard to know oneself. It's also hard to sculpt oneself. What is an idea? It is an image that sculpts itself in my brain. Sculptors take the same liberties as madmen and poets. Sculpture is not a science. Sculpture causes its practitioners to sweat and suffer from great fatigue. How different the painter and composer situation they are well dressed. They live in clean houses. The sculptor is covered in dust and powder, looking like a baker. The sculptor is an orator, the painter a grammarian, and the composer somewhere in between. I think I shall know how to be original even while imitating. Who among great men and women has not imitated? Nothing comes from nothing. We are all the sons and daughters of Homer. Sing in me, muse, and through me, Say a little bit about your experience of the interaction of the audience with the maniac and the table. Um, well, you know, I'm, I can't speak from vast experience because I've only been a maniac for a couple of days, but uh, um, uh, I think that people were very engaged. Um, they were particularly engaged once I started to speak. Um, I found that, you know, I, to standing still for a long time at the beginning, there were, at a certain point, people were like, oh, this is a, bore and this is a boring you know, thing. So I sort of tried to keep it going as long as possible without having people walk out. And then the explosion of verbiage uh, um, and, and, and emotion. Um, you know, I, I had some, at, at one point, I take off, at the end of the, um, uh, of the cycle, I take off the crown and put it back onto um, its pedestal, there's a sort of, a bag of clay that it sits on, and there was an older couple who had no intention of moving, so I had to retreat and continue with the show. <laughs> and then the second time I thought, I, got, I, I can't do anymore, so I came around from the side. Um, a couple people wanted to shake my hand while I was sort of disrobing, but still in character, so I didn't, I didn't shake their hand, but then I felt bad. Uh, um, I guess this would be one of the few examples where a, a sculpture feels bad about, you know, uh, um, hurting the feelings of, uh, of, of the people viewing uh, uh, um, their audience, the, its audience. So we have about 30 seconds left. Where's the work going to be shown after it leaves the jazz? Well, the intention, um, again, the idea for an idea is to go on a, at least a year-long international tour. So there are a number of museums in the States, including um, the Columbus Museum in um, Columbus, Georgia, um, a museum in, in Holland, um, and various institutions here and, and abroad. Well, good luck with that. Thank you, Philip, for taking the time to speak with us today. We're looking forward to uh, seeing more of these performances. Thank you. I've been speaking with artist and filmmaker Philip Haas. His performance installation, Sculpture Breathes Life into Painting and Music, was on view at the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art from May 29th through June 9th, 2019. Thanks so much for watching. <laughs>